A neutralization reaction between an acid and a base produces a salt. We're most familiar with this in the context of strong acids reacting with strong bases. For example, HCl reacting with NaOH to form water and NaCl. Now, by salt here, we really just mean an ionic compound. And so the byproduct of a proton transfer, which includes a positive cation, typically which received the proton, and a negative anion, which was part of the species that donated the proton, the compound formed from those two ions is the salt. In this case, it's NaCl. A skill that you should get very familiar with and that you're going to apply countless times as you go through chemistry courses is taking an ionic compound and splitting it up into its component ions. So it's really critical in this case and in all others where we're dealing with salt solutions or even salts as solids to be able to separate this into its component ions, Na plus and Cl minus. In fact, when we take a salt and dissolve it in water, the pH of the resulting solution may or may not be neutral. Likewise, when we perform a neutralization reaction to generate a salt, the resulting salt solution may not be neutral. That is, the salt produced may itself be acidic or basic. And the pH of that resulting solution of salt depends on the acidity and basicity of the ions. Essentially, one of the ions has the potential to act as an acid and the other has the potential to act as a base. Whichever of the two is stronger is going to dictate the acidic or basic behavior of the salt. We'll see exactly how that works over the next several slides. So we can think about four pH situations for salt solutions by thinking about these neutralization reactions. So the same ideas apply whether we start with the solid salt and dissolve it in, say, a beaker of water to generate the salt solution, or we start with two solutions of, let's say, in this case, a strong acid and a strong base in water, and react them together with the appropriate stoichiometry to generate the salt solution. The final result is the same, right? If the concentration of the salt at the end of the day is the same, then taking the solid and dissolving it to generate the salt solution is the same and will achieve the same pH as mixing an acid with a base. For thinking conceptually about pH, it can be helpful to consider these neutralization reactions. So for example, our first situation here is a strong acid and a strong base, something like HCl and NaOH. In this case, the neutralization reaction produces water and sodium chloride, Na plus Cl minus. In general here, we need to determine the acidity and basicity of the component ions. Often, the cation will act as an acid and the anion as a base, and we should start by considering the acidity of the cation and the basicity of the anion. In this case, Na plus is the conjugate acid of sodium hydroxide. We can see that if we think about adding a proton to Na plus OH minus, that's going to generate H2O, the proton will latch onto the hydroxide and will be left only with the Na plus. So Na plus is itself the conjugate acid of Na plus OH minus, sodium hydroxide. Likewise, Cl minus is more straightforwardly the conjugate base of HCl. And if we consider the strengths of NaOH as a base and HCl as an acid, we see that both of them are strong, which means that their conjugates, which appear in the salt, are both weak. In fact, very weak in this case. These very weak components of the salt species will not re react with water to any appreciable degree. Such reactions would alter the pH of the solution by converting H2O to either H3O plus or OH minus, depending on which component is reacting. We're going to see examples of that in the subsequent neutralization reactions. But in this case, where a strong acid is mixed with a strong base, we end up with, with a very weak cation and a very weak anion. And thus, the pH of this solution is going to be 7. If we think about this from the perspective of dissolving sodium chloride in water, the water started out at pH 7, and dissolving the Na plus Cl minus in there doesn't cause any sort of reaction to happen to a significant degree, so the pH remains 7. Let's now consider reacting a strong base, something like sodium hydroxide, with a weak acid. A good example of a weak acid is acetic acid, for example, which I'll just abbreviate as HA. 
In this case, we'll still have a complete reaction because the base is strong, it's going to react fully, and we now end up with Na plus A minus and H2O. And let's take a brief moment to appreciate what's happening here. A proton is being transferred from HA to OH minus. This generates neutral water since a proton is H plus. The sodium cation acts completely as a spectator, so it's Na plus in the reactants and it's Na plus in the products. And because a proton was lost from HA, the remaining A fragment has an additional lone pair and a negative charge on it, which is why A minus appears here. So we end up with aqueous Na plus, aqueous A minus, and water. To determine the pH of the solution of the salt in water, what we again need to do is consider the acidity of the cation and the basicity of the anion by considering the conjugates like we did before. So for example, Na plus, like we saw before, is the conjugate acid of NaOH, which is itself a very strong base. That makes the Na plus cation very weak, just as it was very weak in the last example. That's actually a direct consequence of it coming from the strong base sodium hydroxide over here. So it will always be the case when we use a strong base, the conjugate that's produced after the neutralization reaction is going to be very weak. A minus, on the other hand, is the conjugate base of acetic acid, HA, which is itself a weak acid. That makes A minus, the conjugate base, itself weak. And here we have to be really careful to draw a distinction between very weak and just weak, that means that Ka for Na plus is going to be smaller than Kb for A minus, and A minus drives the reactivity with water. The anion A minus that ends up in the salt is basic enough to react with water to a degree. The reaction that occurs is just the base association reaction of the anion with water. This is important to keep in mind as well, that all of these reactions that salts engage in when they're dissolved in water or produced via a neutralization reaction always involve water as a reactant. Don't react this with H3O plus in the solution, which is there in a very, very negligible concentration compared to the amount of water present, right? Water is the solvent, and so it's going to be the major reacting species in this and other examples of reactions of salt solutions. This is a common theme, by the way, that we're going to see again when we talk about reactions in buffer solutions in chapter 16. The products here will be the conjugate acid HA and hydroxide, and it's the production of hydroxide via this base association process that drives the pH greater than 7. If we again think about taking this salt, Na plus A minus, and just dissolving it in water rather than running a neutralization reaction, we can see that the pH of the water would start out at 7, but via this base association process, the reaction of A minus with water, we would generate some hydroxide, and that would drive the pH greater than 7. An easy way to remember this and to help yourself get an intuitive feel is to notice that we used a strong base up here in conjunction with a weak acid, and bases cause pH is greater than 7, right? So intuitively, it should feel right that when we mix a strong base with a weak acid, we should end up with a pH greater than 7. We can also think about the reaction of weak bases with strong acids, a neutralization process that also produces a salt. Let's consider, for example, a weak base like NH3 reacting with a strong acid HCl to produce NH4 plus and Cl minus. And this is an interesting case where water is not generated, but we've still made a salt, NH4 plus Cl minus. That's an ionic compound. Right? If we're talking about aqueous NH3 and aqueous HCl, there's water around. So we do end up with a solution of NH4 plus in water at the end of the day. And so even though we haven't generated water in the course of this neutralization reaction, we have made a solution of a salt in water. As we've done in the previous two cases, we need to consider the acidity of the cation and the basicity of the anion. And again, we need to think about the conjugates. So NH4 is the conjugate acid of the base NH3. Cl- is the conjugate base of the acid HCl. Like we saw in the first example, because HCl is a strong 
acid, Cl- is very weak as a base. Because NH3 is a weak base, NH4+, plus, the conjugate, is weak as an acid. But relative to Cl-, minus, it's a stronger acid than Cl is as a base. In other words, Ka for the deprotonation of NH4+, plus, is greater than Kb for the protonation of Cl-. minus. This means that our active ion, the ion that is really dictating the pH in the salt solution, is NH4+. Plus. It's the stronger or more reactive ion. And in the resulting salt solution in general, we can say that the conjugate acid of the initial weak base, which we can ab abbreviate as HB plus in general, will react with water and influence the pH. So we should expect a pH different from 7 in this case. In particular, if we think about how, for example, NH4 will engage with water, NH4 plus will act as an acid. It's a cation and it's got acidic protons. It will act as an acid and donate its proton to water, generating NH3 and H3O plus. And it's the production of H3O plus right here that drives the pH less than 7. So once again, if we think about starting with ammonium chloride, if we think about just starting with this salt in solid form and dissolving it in water, the pH of the water starts out at 7. But as soon as we dissolve this NH4 plus cation, which is much more active as an acid than Cl minus is as a base, it's going to react with water to a non-negligible degree to produce hydronium and drive the pH less than 7. And again, intuitively here, we can look back at the original neutralization conditions and realize that we took a strong acid and reacted it with a weak base. And so it makes sense since acids tend to drive pHs down that when we take a weak base and react it with a strong acid, the pH is going to end up less than 7. Finally, we have the combination of a weak base with a weak acid. So we might represent this in general as B and HA. And I'm going to keep this discussion a little bit general because this can get a little bit complicated. The neutralization process is just a proton transfer from HA to B. And so we end up with HB plus, since we're transferring H plus from HA to B, and A minus. And this is a salt, right? So again, if B is aqueous and HA is aqueous, then what we end up with at the end of this neutralization process is a solution of HB plus A minus in water. In other words, a salt solution. Now we have both a weak base and a weak acid. So considering the conjugates gets a little bit complicated because B, the conjugate base of HB+, is a weak base. And HA, the conjugate acid of A-, minus, is also a weak acid. And so what we can say then is that qualitatively HB+, plus is weak as an acid, and A- minus is weak as a base. So they're both weak, so we can't draw any immediate conclusions about which one of the two is going to be the active or more reactive ion. We can, however, take a quantitative angle and look at Ka for Hb plus as an acid and Kb for A minus as a base. And in fact, we've done this implicitly in the previous examples, realizing that one of these two is going to be much, much larger than the other when one of the ions is very weak. That's what happened in the previous two situations, right? However, here we have a more finely balanced situation. And so what we need to do is quantitatively compare Ka to Kb and realize that the larger K value will correspond to the dominant process. So for example, if the Ka for Hb plus is greater than the Kb for A minus, then Hb plus is the active ion. Hb plus is the ion that's going to react with water in a dominant way to dictate the pH. And in fact, we can ignore the behavior of A minus completely in this case and just worry about a single process, the proton transfer from Hb plus to water generating hydronium and B. This is a process that creates hydronium, right? That means that the pH of the resulting solution is going to be less than 7, and we're mapping onto a situation that's similar to the strong acid weak base, where the pH ended up less than 7. On the other hand, if the Kb for A minus 
is greater than the Ka for Hb. In that case, we need only look at the behavior of A minus. It's the active ion. It's the one doing the business, and it will dictate the pH. It'll react with water to generate reversibly HA and hydroxide, and because we've generated hydroxide, the resulting pH is going to be greater than 7, and we're mapping onto a situation that's similar to the strong base weak acid situation that we saw previously. So this is the trickiest of the four situations, but it illustrates the general process really nicely. In the other three examples, we're implicitly comparing the Ka and Kb values for the cation and anion. We just know by virtue of the fact that one or the other of the two is weak that we can ignore its behavior in water. The last thing I want to emphasize is that in all of these examples, we're using water as a reactant. That's critical to keep in mind. Water is the dominant species in all of these solutions. It's the solvent. It will be the major player in these reactions of the cations or anions. Unless we have externally added hydronium or hydroxide, which we will see in future discussions of titrations, the reactant we want to deal with in these equilibrium processes is water.